So thank you for um, giving me some time. Welcome to Santa Monica, our, our company Sensei, which is a wellness lifestyle and technology company, is, is based in Santa Monica. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to both welcome you to this, uh, this wonderful town, and it's nice for us to be invited into this conference. You know, our company Sensei was founded by uh, a very both humorous and optimistic oncologist, Dr. David Agus, who is probably most well-known for being the oncologist, the cancer doctor to Lance Armstrong and Steve Jobs. And so our company has with it a great deal of discipline around science and data. And he, he helps to infuse that. And the other founder of Sensei is Larry Ellison. So we also have infused a tremendous amount of entrepreneurship and technology in our DNA. So not surprising, I'm here to talk to you about wellness and technology. So in order to do that, um, I, wanted, I want to start with the, you know, the consumer, which is really on everybody's mind, and bring to light something that's self-evident to everybody here, which is there's been psychographically, sociologically, a seismic shift in the culture. And it's seismic. If I talk to my psychographic uh, analysts and I will talk to my sociological uh, professors, they speak about <clears throat> there are moments in society where there are trends. There are moments in society where there's some changes of, of culture. But then there is times when there's trauma to the system that there's actually a change in, in value systems. Not just a change in behavior that we all did. We all lock down. We all put on masks, social distance. Obviously, that's, those are symptomatic of change. But we also shifted value systems. And in those value systems, one of the things we shifted was a greater sense of awareness around well-being. Now, well-being is an interesting definition. I want to spend a little time talking to you about our definition of it based on my 40 years of working in this industry. And the notion is this big shift in the culture was seen most <coughs> apparent that people had career one and relationships two. And it flipped. It flipped after two years. And those of you who are trying to get your staff to come back into the office, you'll know that. That basically they're saying, look, career still matters. My job matters. Purpose matters. But not at the expense anymore of my relationships. And that's a significant shift. Mark Twain talks about, hey, there are liars, damn liars, and statistics, right? So we can all throw a lot of statistics up, though the Accor's data I thought was really really quite impressive and helpful. Um, but what really matters is depending on how you measure it, do I include Whole Foods and Nike and vitamin supplements and spa and hotel travel and wellness travel, and if I you know, put it all in a big bucket, preventive health, beauty, um, you know, the, the economics around the Global Wellness Institute talk about four and a half trillion. McKinsey has a narrower definition. They talk about a one and a half trillion dollar you know, discretionary in income annually. So e either way, it's a huge number. It's a huge number, number one. And number two, the trend lines, the growth rate, is really somewhere between 6 and 7%. So we're, like, we're leaning into a shift of culture. We're leaning into an industry around wellness. Is a great, there's greater awareness. And every study we're taking a look at, wellness is more and more important. Now, when I was the president of Canyon Ranch in 2001, we did a study and found at that time wellness was, a, was important to about 40, 43% of, of the, our target market, which is predominantly a luxury market. And when we did, when my company, I left Kenya Ranch and my company did a study with America Lies and MMGY in 2010, that had moved up to about 80%. And we're seeing those same numbers from independent studies uh, today. So that's a pretty big deal. And second, when we look at the younger generation, that have similar values as their parents, though they, they um, practice differently, you're finding that to them, which makes sense, because they're all young and healthy, they're not all older and still you know, bending over and making sounds, um, but th what they're finding is that their emotional well-being is critical to them. Obviously, their physical well-being is too, because they became much more aware of the vulnerability of illness because of COVID. Um, the good news for us, is you know, seven, you know, two things. If anyone that's been looking at their, their ADRs in the last six months in the luxury market, 
when you can get to this place, those rates are going up pretty high. Everybody's looking pretty good right now. All those GMs are seeing a pretty good ADR uh, escalation. Um, but, but second, 75% of the people are saying, I want to go on a wellness vacation, often an emotionally wellness vacation, or I need to get away. And right now, particularly with this next wave of uncertainty, it's still going to remain you know, within the US or regional, depending on if you're in Europe, you know, you're going to stay regional. But people want to take a vacation. So I, I started um, in the sustainability and wellness industry literally 40 years ago and, and built the first sustainable community in the US and then built the first carbon neutral resort, uh, then became president of Canyon Ranch. So I've been in this business a long time. And I remember how hard it was to talk uh, about the value of wellness, the value of sustainability, the value of these cultures on a balance sheet when you're trying to raise capital. And really, that's not the case anymore, uh, as the numbers were reflected earlier in the last speaker, is that it's now become kind of the new black, right? Wellness is, is the new black. And the good news is those trend lines, the discretionary income going towards it, and looking at wellness as a as an opportunity for interfacing and, and grabbing consumer market share is significant everywhere, not just in our industry. It suggests to me that you will not be in most consumer-facing industries in the next decade if wellness isn't part of the equation. Now, I have that quote from Tim Cook. He was asked about, what is the legacy of Apple? Now, I think of computer, I think of the iPhone, I think of the watch. Obviously, now Apple streaming, uh, Apple Plus is going to be a big thing, and now th there's hints of the, of the Apple car coming out in, in, uh, in uh, two or three years. And yet, what did he say? He said, Apple will be known for its health. So that's a pretty significant statement. So what, what is wellness? You know, we've studied this a long time, <clears throat> and uh, two things. I mean, wellness in one sense is kind of a parochial term. Right? You can buy a wellness basket at the uh, Walgreens with the candle and the meditation tape and some bath salts. But when we really look at wellness, we tend to define it in terms of, look, um, wellness lifestyle is fundamentally about what uh, in my life supports my value system for, my, for, for me finding greater well-being. So when we talk about Sensei, we talk about we're a wellness lifestyle company. We're a, we have a value system, we have a mission, and what we do is measured against uh, that parameter. When we think of wellness, wellness is more uh, objective. I can measure wellness. What is my heart rate? What is my maximum heart rate? What is my resting heart rate? What is my cholesterol? You know, what is my VO2 breath intake? You know, what are the things I can do? Um, I can measure my state of wellness, and it's really an objective number. And then we have the more important, the larger idea called well-being. And if you talk to the consumer, while they interchange the language, they ultimately talk about their well-being. It's a subjective measurement of where they feel is the state of their health, their own personal comfort, and, and basically their happiness. So in 2010, I did a study. We continued that study through, in, uh, th through a different company of mine. It started at Kenya Ranch, ended up with Savano, my other company, before I went to Sensei. And we worked with America Lives and MGY, two good research companies. And the study was, hey, how do you define well-being? How does the consumer define it? Because we want to figure out how to talk to them. And we did 90 US markets and two in Mexico. We did, over that period, over 100,000 uh, uh, surveys and studies in 90 markets in the US. And what we found, no matter what, we gave people 12 definitions, the right to write in the 13th, you know, mind, body, spirit, for your disease, all sorts of logical definitions. 63 to 66% of every market we tested was number one, I measure my well-being by how hopeful, joyful, and energized I feel. So our well-being is ultimately measured as an emotional outcome. And that's critical. So I need to have the metrics Often, I need to have the diagnostics, I need to have the wellness uh, ob uh, uh, objective analysis, but ultimately I measure my well-being by an emotional outcome. So <clears throat> 40, 50, 60 years ago now, anyone's watching the Let It Be on, on streaming lately, um, the, when the boomers were evolving and emerging, there's this basic notion that we went back because 
everything became so specialized, things were somewhat siloed, and we went back and sort of found ancient traditions and brought it back to the US. You know, I like to say when George Harrison put the sitar in the Rubber Soul album is, is the social demarcation. And, and in that period, people started to say, look, we have to find, you know, our mind, body, spirit, this balance, because there's, in fact, there's an there's a equilibrium always to find the whole self. And, you know, we've, because we have a lot of smart uh, millennials with us, they don't let us use that woo-woo language anymore. And we talk about move, rest, and nourish, but it's the same basic concept of you have to find this balance. And, um, and then that was the first ripple when we dropped that pebble of interconnectivity in the water, right? And over the years, as it expanded outward, the thought process was the same about interconnectivity and interdependency, but the definition expanded with the consumer, with the US consumer. And people started to say, well, it's not just my individual well-being, it's how I relate within my community and how my community relates within, within the planet or within nature, right? Now, your community could be as small as you and your partner. It could be you and your family. It could be you and your town. It could be you and your tribe, or you and your company. Uh, or it could be something larger. But what you perceive your well-being and your, and your, your relationship, your tribe, your family's well-being, are interconnected to your emotional well-being. You know, you're only as happy as your saddest child, right? And then second, we start to realize that, look, and we're seeing this more and more now with climate change, is the fact is, if I'm worried about my house burning down in California, if I'm worried about the pine trees and the beetles eating up the pine trees in Montana, or we have to stop our, our fly fishing in the rivers because the rivers are warming up now, which is happening uh, a month early, if my place is flooding in, you know, in the Lower East Side or along the, the beaches of Louisiana or Florida, if the hurricanes are, are um, or the tornadoes are more dangerous in Oklahoma, if the weather's more erratic, these things are affecting me. It's not simply a political statement from the consumer's point of view. You know, we, in 1995, I did a study when, when we built the first sustainable community, and we asked, why do only 7% of people take their, take their recycle bin down to the recycle center on a Saturday, but yet 65% bring their little plastic bin 22 feet down to their curb, right? And part of that was, if you make it easy enough, if the hurdles are reduced, I'll try to do the right thing, and I feel pretty good about it. And then we said, well, this is interesting. 65% at that time, 1995, only 15% of, the, of the, the market, the consumer, was considered ideologically green. So we said, OK, well, that explains 15. Where's the other 50% coming from? And we called it the, it's a nurturing instinct, that somehow people know something's wrong here. I don't really have a, a great reason, but if I can take this, this this plastic down to the curb, you know, I could do a little something. So I say this planet not in any kind of political terms, but the fact is this is where the consumer is. So in order to look at wellness, <clears throat> we've established it as an emotional sense. We established that there's metrics and diagnostics and there's science behind it. Um, what, we, <clears throat> what we have to realize is there's a technological component too. Now, you all know this because this industry, other than the healthcare industry, nobody was hit harder and reacted quicker to the pandemic with technology, with you know, effortless, with you know, barcodes and Q codes and touchless, whatever, you know, uh, on uh, reservations. We know, you know, back to McKinsey, that hey, in the first three months, there was about a jump in about of four years of technological ad adaption, right? They adopted the technology. And then, the latest numbers I saw, it looks like we adopted it over two years to about seven, seven to eight years. Some companies more advanced, but it's about the average. When then you start to think about what's going to happen with AI and the metaverse, and even today we're having a conference that's somewhat augmented reality because we're zooming people in, right? And that, in fact, that technology is going to continue to advance. So technology is a factor, and it is also a growth factor. And when it comes to health, you know, a wearables become very important. You know, there's a reason everybody put oxidation factors on their, on their, their, their watches, their Apple watches, their Whoop bands, their, the, now the Fitbit bands, the Aura rings. Um, I don't think Aura ring has oxidation yet. But they, they did it because people started to realize, geez, you know, one of the symptoms of COVID is my lung capacity goes, it gets, goes first before I start to show other illnesses. So people are starting to look at not just telemedicine, but they're now starting to track with wearables their own information, their own health. 
So technology is going to be integral into well-being, particularly if technology is going to be integral into the wellness component of well-being because it's part of the metrics, part of the diagnostics. So we have to be prepared for that if you want to be in the wellness space, which is the largest consumer space, and one of the best delivery systems for it, of course, is leisure travel. And when we start looking at what you have to measure, well, you know, you have to look at heart rate, you have to look at sleep patterns. The other one is very huge around the sleep, as we all know. Movement and fitness, we have to look at nutrition. And, um, and so that means we have to get very sophisticated, very knowledgeable in content and in data, how to aggregate it, organize it, and disseminate it, and, and use it um, and help empower our, our customer. So how do you do that? Well, the way we do it, is you know, we, we really rely a lot on technology. Now we have a bunch of smart engineers that come from SpaceX and Google and other places, Tesla, and that now work for us. And you know, we, we found a way, we have a partnership with Whoop, and we, have a, we found a way that when you come to us and we actually download your wearable ad, and, and we're first doing it with Whoop, but we're, we have the APIs to figure out how to do it with the Apple and Fitbit and Aura Ring. And so we're starting to be able to download your heart rate, your sleep patterns, you know, your oxidation, your movement, your fitness. Um, then when you come in with us, like most of us, we have some sort of diagnostic center. We can measure your strength, your flexibility, your VO2, how much oxygen you're taking in. Um, now you do that, that this, that's the technological part, and then you have to have best in class. Because the customer, and this was earlier about the customer is not going to accept mediocrity right, in service, and if we start talking about wellness, it can no longer just be somebody that's got a year uh, um, from, you know, a fitness instructor from some college. They're looking for area experts. So you have to bring in enough talent that you have best in class in your programs and services. They have to be knowledgeable. In our case, we happen to have doctors. And, I mean, he's too smart for me, but our, our head of our wellness has a PhD in genetics, a medical degree, and a certification in orovetic medicine. This is one guy, and he's like 38. So, um, so for, fortunately, I, I try to surround myself with really smart people and then get out of their way. And then you have to have enough content so people are going to want it. Either borrow it from the, you know, from the web, lease it out, um, but you have to have content that, that also can help people understand, interpret, and utilize for their well-being. So that's the, that's the wellness part. But the well-being part, the emotional part, is equally probably more important. It's about caring practitioners. You can't simply just, you know, you can no longer just be ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen, though that's an honorable and a good place to start. You have to be deeply emotionally, they have to trust you because you're now, with, you're now affecting their life. You know, uh, the, old store, the old hotel said, I am going to have such great service and have su such good accoutrements that the, the, my guest has a good experience, a great memory, and comes back come back to me, you know, brand loyalty. A wellness company, a wellness uh, resort says, no, no, we have to do that, that's the ante, because all you great hotel people have made us make that the ante, so thank you very much. Um, but we say, we, you need to learn something about yourself while you're with us that's valuable enough to you that you, you actually incorporate it into your life when you leave. We're actually in the behavioral change business. And in order to do that, you have to, have your, you have to have your left brain, your science, your data, your content, your facts correct. And you have to have your, your right brain. You have to have the emotional side. You have to have the trusting side. You have to have the high touch. Because if I don't bring you to an emotionally safe place, you're not going to let go enough to really be open to the possibilities. And that's one of the nuances that's hard to explain but critical in the success. So listen, we've all been through a lot for the last two years. So I don't have to tell anybody, though we all want to tap each other on the shoulder and say, good job, I think you know, it, it's warranted. Um, we've had to adapt. Our people have been through a lot, particularly our frontline people. They've had furloughs and layoffs. They've had openings and closings. I think our first property in Lanai, we opened and closed between October, November of 2019 until beginning of 20, end of 2020, I think we opened and closed. We closed five times and opened four. Like, give me a break, right? At the end, it was like, you know, so routine. I didn't, I didn't even go there for the opening. Um, and, but they've, they've had to worry about not only their health, their family's health, but their livelihood. 
right? And opening and closings and furloughs and, and the unknowns. And then they had to learn new techniques of how to smile at a front desk with a mascot. I don't know how they do, but you can still tell the right people who are smiling, you know? I always, I, you know, I'm not as good at, as, at that as others, but, you know, they've had to learn how to deal with new cleaning techniques and, and new service protocols and, and, and deal with vaccinations and who gets to go and who's being tested. Um, and then, by the way, they saw their brethren in the corporate offices working from home on Zoom while they're putting masks on and putting themselves at risk. And believe me, while they didn't blame anyone, that was not lost on any of them. We owe them something. And they're about to tell us when it's time to negotiate pay raises. Um, but even then, they came and they cared for those in trauma, the guest, because the guest was also going through that same thing. And when the time they came to those properties, as many of you, you know those stories, they were dealing with people often caring and sometimes quite belligerent because that, that our, our society, the people were also in trauma. So we, we had to learn to adapt and our people had to learn to, hey, just calling me an associate is not enough anymore. I want respect, I wanna be valued differently, right? And that's something we're gonna to have to think about and that goes to the labor shortage that was mentioned earlier. And um, the good news is the ability for our industry to take advantage of this well-being, this shift, is great. It, assuming we have substantive technology, we have caring staff, we build in the wellness, not simply as a checklist. Oh, yeah, add, add an extra room and we'll call it the spa, and then another room we call it the fitness gym. And No, this has to be part of indoctrinated into the culture. If we do that well, we can do it better than others because even though Whoop can sell a million bands or Apple can send, sell 100 million bands or watches, they don't touch people. They're not as real. We are actually interacting with people at a human level that gives us quite an advantage. We have a platform that others don't have. We can take advantage, we can be of good service, and we can actually build a bigger niche in this growing consumer market. So just to show you a little sense of how we sort of we, we interpret it, Oh, I gotta go back. There's a little 90 second film here, if it's going on. It was? Okay. Thank you.